Hi guys, welcome back to In Case of Econ Struggles. Welcome to another AP Micro Struggle. Today I'm talking about topic 6.1, which is about social efficiency or socially optimal outcomes. Timestamps are below if you would like to jump around, but let's get right into it. Now, the point of topic 6.1 is to get us to think about something we haven't really thought about so far. And what we're going to think about is that my decisions might impact someone else. Specifically, firms' actions might impact consumers, or vice versa, consumers' actions may impact other consumers. So we're going to sort of relax some of those assumptions that we've talked about before. And since it's a little wonky, I'm just going to start with a really basic example. So let's say that you live in a town. Here's the town. Here are some people in this town. And Bill, Bill owns the power plant that supplies electricity to this town. But Bill's power plant burns coal. So because Bill's power plant burns coal, you have this lovely cloud of polluted air that comes out of the smokestacks of Bill's factory or Bill's generators and hovers over the town. So what you've got is you've got a price for your electricity, let's call it $5 for a megawatt hour. Megawatt hour, just a fancy unit for electricity. Don't worry too much about it if you don't really get that. Just think the price of electricity is like $5. And now the people can buy masks in order to kind of defend themselves against the polluted air. And let's say that masks are about a dollar per that same unit. So first, I want us to think about two things. The first is how does Bill choose how much electricity to generate? And really what I'm asking is does Bill think about this polluted air when he's determining how much electricity to make? And so based on your answer to that question, again, comment below what you think the answer to that question is. Based on the answer to that question, how much electricity do you think it's socially optimal to generate? And by socially optimal, I mean we're maximizing both Bill's welfare and the people's welfare. And again, we're trying to take into account that the people have this pollution they have to deal with that's a real cost to their lives. So what I'm going to argue is that Bill is just going to set the marginal cost equal to the marginal revenue. So notice that his marginal cost is $4 per megawatt hour. The price is $5. He's pumping out as much electricity as he can. He's burning as much coal as his generators can handle. And he's not going to think about the impact of that generation on the people in the town. He's not going to think about the fact that his smokestacks are putting out pollution that's impacting the town nearby to this power plant. And so what we're going to say is the fact that Bill doesn't think about that means that $4 is the marginal private cost because that's not taking into account the pollution that comes about because of the less electricity generation. But if we were to think about this impact, let's just say the impact is completely captured by this $1 per megawatt hour in terms of mass spending, we're going to call that the marginal social cost. So that's the social cost to generate one unit of electricity, not just the $4, which is the only cost that Bill cares about. And so this difference between the marginal private cost and the marginal social cost, it's a dollar, but we call that the marginal external cost. So if you can keep that example in mind, I think it's going to be straightforward when we move to a supply and demand diagram. So here's a supply and demand diagram. Here's our demand curve. Here's our supply curve, just like we've seen before. And so we have a Q star and a P star. But this private cost, this blue line, doesn't take into account the cost of pollution on this town. If I want to think about the cost of pollution on this town, I am going to have to make the cost higher at every quantity. I'm going to have to raise it by that dollar per megawatt hour that we just talked about. So if I'm increasing the supply curve, I'm shifting the supply curve up. And so this pink line here is going to be the social cost. That's the total cost to society, not just the cost that the firm or bill cares about. And so if I think about where this social cost supply curve meets the demand curve, you can see that I'm going to have a lower quantity, which makes sense because of making electricity is polluting. Probably don't want to make as much as just Bill thinks he should pump out. The price is going to be higher because if we have a lower quantity, we're going to have a higher price. So this makes a lot of sense. One other thing to note, notice that this quantity SO, this socially optimal quantity, is not zero. We still want electricity to power our homes, to power our computers. We don't necessarily want that electricity or that polluting good to be zero, but we want it to be less than if just the firms decide how much to make by setting marginal revenue equal to marginal private cost. And so if this example was helpful or if it wasn't helpful, just leave me a comment below so I can sort of think about planning future examples. But one question that I get a lot 
as well it's easy to think about pollution or negative things that impact others are there functions of production that sort of have a positive impact on the surrounding area that answer is yes let me give you another example let's say that bill bill no longer makes electricity bill makes honey so to make honey bill has a bunch of beehives and so what's happened is these beehives sort of go out into the town and they visit a nearby park because there's a park in this town and so as part of keeping bees the bees pollinate the flowers in the park the park is really pretty people are able to walk through the park and see all these beautiful flowers and see all the bees that sort of pollinate these flowers it's really nice so now the town actually gets a benefit out of bill making honey and so if they're getting a benefit out of bill making honey bill is probably not taking that benefit into account so you might think well it's probably the case that bill is making too little that's exactly right if bill is having a positive impact on the society around him we want bill to make more honey now let's show that in a graph notice that the private cost is right here this is the private benefit so this is like everyone gets to enjoy their own honey bill gets paid by selling the honey but that's not taking into account the fact that people get to go to this park and see all these beautiful flowers so if we want to take that into account we need to add that to the social benefit so this is now sort of a like marginal external benefit rather than a marginal external cost. And you can see that compared to this green optimum, this green competitive equilibrium, the new socially optimal point is going to be at a higher price and a higher quantity because we want Bill to make more honey if it's gonna make the flowers in the park flower better. And so if we want to make Bill make more honey, we're gonna to have to pay Bill more per jar of honey. So hopefully this makes sense. Again, leave a comment below if you're confused or if you're getting it. But the next sort of question we have to think about is, okay, this makes a lot of sense, or maybe I'm starting to get it, but I'm a little confused about the difference between this green point and this socially optimal or point in dark blue. And here's the thing. The difference between competitive equilibrium and socially optimum is basically, are you thinking about total benefits and total costs or just private benefits and private costs? So when we talk about a competitive equilibrium, when we first did supply and demand, we just set demand equal to supply. We found our Q star and our P star. And what we were really doing is setting the marginal benefit or the marginal private benefit equal to the marginal private cost. But then when we moved on to socially optimum, we now need to think about the social benefit and the social cost. And so that's gonna shift either the supply or demand curve up or down and we use that new social cost or social demand curve in order to find our socially optimal quantity and our socially optimum price. So with that, one thing that's sort of useful to keep in mind is that if you don't have externalities, we'll talk about externalities in the next video, and you have perfect competition, then the competitive equilibrium will be the same as the socially optimum quantity and price. Now notice for the AP exam, your problems will indicate if your externalities are part of the problem or not, so if you don't see anything about externalities, assume there are no externalities. This is confusing because now that you've learned this, you might think, well, there's externalities everywhere. So you're looking for those sort of externalities in every problem you're taking, but that won't be the case. The AP exam will make it very clear if there's externalities or not. And again, we'll do some practice problems as we get closer to May that'll hopefully make that more clear as well. So if this was helpful, make sure to like and subscribe, and we'll see you next time for another case of Econ Struggles.